Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I think we'll have some more people streaming in as, as the uh, uh, proceedings uh, go on. Um, I just want to thank everybody for coming out uh, to listen to this uh, extremely interesting discussion uh, that was uh, initiated, really, as a result of a, a conference that was held by uh, former Secretary General of the UN, Kofi Annan, Global Humanitarian Forum, which was looking at the impacts of climate change for the poor and the impoverished in the world. Um, at that forum, um, there was a, uh, a last session that had both uh, Evo de Boer and uh, uh, Jeffrey Sachs uh, participating. And I have to say, as somebody who was in the audience, um, I was expecting a, a nice little discussion amongst the like-minded, and all of a sudden broke out a very, very interesting discussion. Uh, the ends, there's no question, and I don't want to speak for them, uh, one hardly could in both cases. Uh, the end is very much, I think, what they both have in mind is very similar, that we have a serious, very serious threat in front of us as far as climate change is concerned. But the means, particularly as far as economic instruments and policies are concerned, uh, there's a, an interesting uh, a divergence and an interesting uh, uh, range of views. Unfortunately, they were only able to get into the discussion for about five minutes. Um, and so uh, later that evening, we were all ensconced on a boat, on a boat tour on Lake Geneva, and I was able to corner the both of them. And uh, they were quite agreeable to the idea of having a further discussion about this very, very important issue. Um, and I would say that uh, uh, to, uh, right now is extremely timely. It certainly is the time for debates, both in the United States and uh, uh, not as many of you may be aware that we're having a Canadian election as well. So there's been a series of debates up, up north in Canada. Uh, as well. So in the, this being the fall of debates, I thought it would be a good idea if we also had one on this uh, critical issue. The Kyoto Protocol, I think, uh, many people have uh, many different understandings and visions of what it represents. Um, I, sometimes I, when people are always uh, making judgments in terms of whether Kyoto is a success or not, I'm reminded of uh, um, a question once put by a European journalist to Chairman Mao about whether or not the French Revolution was a success, and he replied, it's too early to tell. I would definitely say that was the same case with the Kyoto Protocol, but not because of whether or not individual countries met targets. The real contribution of Kyoto in 50 years' time will have been, it was the first international agreement that set a price signal on carbon. It was a very tentative price signal, but did it initiate a whole regime where we see an ever-strengthening price signal on carbon as a result of that? And in that respect, it really did set the broad parameters for a carbon market, and even went into further detail by defining the Kyoto mechanisms, the clean development mechanism, joint implementation, and international emissions trading. At that time, ironically enough, the real pushers for it were the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Japan, Australia, and the ones who were most reluctant to deal with it, frankly, were the European Union. And now we are in a completely almost Alice in Wonderland situation where it is the EU that is the defenders of the mechanisms and the greatest practitioners and implementers of it. And we see growing concerns, particularly coming out of North America, about the use of such mechanisms. There have been some issues. There's no question about that. And certainly in terms of implementation of such innovative instruments, one could hardly expect otherwise. There's been questions about environmental effectiveness, economic efficiency, technology transfer, wealth transfer, impacts on development, how much is required at home versus abroad. I could go on and on, and they will be covered in this discussion. But the real question is, is this a matter of just getting the wrinkles out in terms of the implementation, or do we really need a radical, and by radical I mean in its classic sense, to the root rethink of, of these kinds of approaches? Because this is more than an intellectual discussion. We need to address this, and very urgently. The one thing I think that there is little dispute about, and what science is showing us, is that we've got 15 to 20 years. And we have to get this right, and we have to get this as right as possible. So I'm very proud to be able to uh, uh, facilitate uh, this discussion. Um, <clears throat> before I go on, I would also like to take note of the fact that we are very aware of the fact that this event is taking place during uh, Yom Kippur. Um, and we would have much preferred to have held this on any other day except today, but unfortunately, given the schedules uh, that we have had to uh, address with the uh, speakers and with our discussants, um, then uh, Carl Lackner and Henry Derwent, um, 
we really had no choice whatsoever, uh, and we definitely uh, and, and do humbly uh, regret that. Um, let me then first give the floor to Evo de Boer. Um, Evo was uh, appointed UN Secretary, was appointed by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan as the new Executive Secretary of the UNFCC on August 10, 2006. The appointment was endorsed by the Bureau of Convention. Before the UNFCC, Evo was uh, Director for International Affairs in the Ministry of Housing, Spatial Planning and Environment of the Netherlands, where he was responsible for international policy and certainly played, and I can say this firsthand, a very key and critical role in influencing the climate change negotiations both in the EU and more broadly internationally. So we, Evo, please uh, come up and uh, make your initial presentation. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, John, and good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and to continue the discussion with Jeff and, uh, and with others. I think we all know that the Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change tells us that by accepting some short-term pain, we stand to reap a lot of long-term gain. And although still a hard political sell, this was, I think, a convincing argument till just a few weeks ago. But since then, things have changed, and things have changed dramatically. And I believe that you cannot pick an empty pocket, and a demandeur cannot afford to be picky. Um, climate change, as you know, is a huge global problem in need of a global solution to reduce the costs of both mitigation and adaptation. And while concerted action significantly reduces the costs, it's clear that we will need all the tools at our disposal to rise to this global challenge. As a result, I think, and I hope you'll agree, that it is rather futile to debate the carbon market versus carbon tax, because in reality, we need the carbon market and national taxes and much more including a clever financial architecture for effective climate change abatement. That said, there is a range of benefits that recommend a market-based approach, and I would like to highlight a few. To start, we need a comprehensive international agreement that guarantees action on all fronts. This requires global buy-in, especially from the private sector, since the largest amount of funds, up to as much as 86% according to our calculations, are, of the clean technologies are actually in the hands of the private sector. Large sectors of that private sector prefer market-based approaches over taxation because this increases the economic opportunities of climate change abatement, both in terms of investment opportunities and in terms of job creation. A market-based approach is acceptable to civil society because environmental benefits can be checked and assured. Then there is the matter of information asymmetry. A tax and an emissions trading scheme are only identical in outcome when governments have full knowledge of the costs of abatement. The first phase of the European emissions trading scheme showed that this is not realistic. Governments do not have precise knowledge of the cost of abatement and need a market mechanism to deliver price discovery. Another important factor to keep in mind is dynamic efficiency, which occurs at two levels. On the first level, the market sets a dynamic incentive for emission reductions as prices change to reflect supply and demand. Whereas taxation rates are hard to change, and therefore the incentive for further reductions tends to become static. On the second level, the market promotes awareness and involvement. Cap and trade creates a new asset class which attracts interest from finance departments and market makers. Many of the emission reduction projects in livestock raising, for example, would never have happened with taxation of methane as companies would have preferred to absorb the cost increase. A market mechanism stimulates a more proactive response. A market approach allows for graded levels of involvement, and this is vital in a United Nations context. So how has the market-based approach 
in its current form under the Kyoto Protocol done so far? The question to ask is, has the Kyoto Protocol's clean development mechanism met the goal for which it was designed? And in my view, the answer to this question is yes. There are now more than 1,170 registered CDM projects in 49 countries. Everything from community electrification to landfill gas capture to industrial chemical projects destroying extremely potent greenhouse gases. Of these projects, more than a third transfer climate-friendly technologies to developing countries. We've just concluded the first year of a five-year commitment period and already more than 195 million certified emission reduction credits have been issued, or certificates I should say, have been issued to some 400 projects. And that is equivalent to 195 million tons of CO2 emissions avoided. And let's look at some of the CDM's further accomplishments. The CDM is stimulating developing country and private sector involvement in emission reductions while it helps to identify cost-effective opportunities for emission reductions. The CDM has provided an important source of investment and financial flows for mitigation action in developing countries. It's estimated that the Clean Development Mechanisms project that entered the pipeline in 2006 will result in a $25 billion capital investment. And it's also estimated that CDM renewable energy and energy efficiency projects that were registered during 2006 will result in a $5.7 billion capital investment. And this is about triple the amount of official assistance for energy policy and renewable energy projects in those same countries. And through a 2% levy on CDM projects, the clean development mechanism is also filling a fund for adaptation in developing countries. Now, all of this said, I'm not blind to the challenges that the CDM has faced, although many of these, I believe, are normal teething problems that new initiatives, especially large ones, face. One of the key challenges is additionality, ensuring that emission reductions are additional to what would have taken place without the project. The rules, tools, and guidance now in place under the CDM mean that we have an acceptable level of certainty that reductions are, in fact, additional. In the end, however, a balance must be struck between, on the one hand, removing every speck of doubt about additionality and, as a result, turning down a great many perfectly good projects, and, on the other hand, taking a too lax approach to additionality. I think that the CDM has managed to strike the balance. Many argue that the CDM is actually too strict. Some would like to see a paring down of the layers of oversight. Bottlenecks in the regulatory process must be addressed and are being addressed to ensure a smooth and steady flow of registered projects and credit issuances. Then there is the question of CDM and sustainable development. Apart from re reducing greenhouse gas emissions, CDM projects are meant to assist countries in achieving sustainable development goals. How this criterion is applied is left up to the host countries themselves. Granted, it is sometimes not obvious how capturing emissions from a waste dump can contribute to development. But let me use such a project in Bali as an example. There, the ability to earn CDM credits has led to the construction of a waste sorting facility, installation of a generator fueled by gas captured from organic waste. It has stopped the dump encroaching into, surrounding man into a surrounding mangrove swamp, and not least, it has provided steady, healthy employment. Some projects are even harder to reconcile with the CDM's sustainable development criteria. But even the lucrative industrial gas projects have their role to play. In China, for example, a full 65% of credits produced from HFC 23 projects go into a sustainable development fund. Now, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that the CDM is relatively new. Whatever criticisms there are of the mechanisms should not be tempered by reflection on just how far the mechanisms have come. In fact, they have created a global environmental currency and in the process have shown, in a practical way, 
how a project-based mechanism can work. And this is just the beginning. The CDM has, I believe, tremendous potential. To achieve that potential, it must be scaled up substantially in terms of both applicability and geography. There are fears that the CDM could unfairly subsidize competitive advantages of developing countries. However, the CDM is an important way to engage developing countries in climate change action. At the same time, the uneven geographical distribution of projects must clearly be addressed. In Africa, for example, there are just 27 registered projects. And while those 27 projects alone are expected to generate a $3.9 billion capital investment, it is clear that Africa needs to benefit more from the clean development mechanism. And this is currently being addressed through specially targeted initiatives which are beginning to bear fruit. Also, as part of the negotiating process, countries are in the process of identifying ways to improve the CDM. They agreed, for example, to consider improvements in scope, effectiveness, efficiency, accessibility, contribution to sustainable development, and the transfer of technology. To rise up to the challenge of climate change, we will need to build on and improve the tools that we have at our disposal. Two of the most powerful tools are the carbon market and market-based mechanisms like the clean development mechanism. The agreed outcome in Copenhagen needs to ring in the global transformation to a low emissions economy. The two-year negotiating process under the Climate Change Convention presents the world with a window of opportunity to craft an economically viable solution to climate change. Current indications show that parties are committed to a strengthened outcome in Copenhagen in 2009 that results in real emission reductions and has support mechanisms to reduce the cost of mitigation and to leverage funding for adaptation. Parties have already indicated that market-based instruments under the Kyoto Protocol should continue beyond 2012. And this is a clear indication of their effectiveness. Furthermore, at the UN Climate Change Conference in Bali last year, all parties to the Convention agreed to step up mitigation actions, including by considering the opportunities of using markets, another clear indication of the effectiveness of this approach. At the same time, the carbon market will not adequately respond to all the challenges we face. Markets do what markets do. They cherry pick the cheapest options and don't guarantee an even geographical distribution. We need a global economic transformation if we want to keep climate change manageable and economic losses due to impacts at a minimum. To illustrate this point, according to the International Energy Agency, global energy demand will grow by 55% by 2030. In the period up to 2030, the energy supply infrastructure worldwide will require a total investment of $22 trillion, with about half of that investment being made in developing countries. If we do not manage to green these investments, to direct them in a climate-friendly direction through climate-friendly technologies, emissions will increase by 50% instead of going down by 50% as science tells us they should. If emissions go up by 50%, there is a good chance that we will be put on a road to unmanageable climate change. Economic development and poverty eradication in developing countries cannot happen without energy. The question is, where will the $11 trillion worth of energy investment needed in developing countries come from? A carbon market and market-based mechanisms, like the clean development mechanism, are essential for, achieve, for achieving the large shifts in investments required, such as for energy supply on the scale that is required to put the world on a clean path to development. However, given the limits of the carbon market, it is clear that we need two sets of tools. The first relates primarily to the private sector, and here we are talking about a cap and trade and market-based mechanisms. The second relates to what governments can do, especially through government-to-government -government cooperation. And here we're essentially talking about taxes, standards, and subsidies. In short, we need different horses for different courses. 
What we are looking for is a set of tools that create value for green growth, an intelligent mix of mechanisms that will spur both public and private money flows through different channels at both the national and the international level. We are hopefully setting out on an incredibly ambitious journey, but under very difficult circumstances. <coughs> Playing down the challenges we face and rejecting tools needed to complete it will not ring credibly in the ears of those that have to take responsibility for some tough political choices that lie ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evo. Um, <clears throat> before I introduce uh, Dr. Sachs, <clears throat> just would like to remind people, um, particularly those who are listening to this on the webcast, uh, that you can submit questions live <clears throat> during this discussion, uh, and they can be submitted at webcast at ei.columbia, that's with a U, not an O, Columbia with a U, dot edu. Um, thank you very much. Um, well, quite a compelling case there, Dr. Sachs, wouldn't you say? Um, uh, and I'm very interested to uh, listen uh, to his response and uh, some alternative visions. Uh, Dr. Sachs is director of the Earth Institute um, and professor of health policy and management at uh, Columbia University, special advisor to the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, and from 2000 to 2006, he was director of the UN Millennium Project and special advisor to the United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan on the Millennium Development Goals. Um, he is also president and co-founder of Millennium Promise Alliance, a nonprofit organization aimed at extending uh, extreme global poverty. Dr. Sachs? Oh, it said ending, excuse me. That was a slip. Excuse me, Dr. Sachs, please. <laughs> Thanks very much, John, and uh, thanks, Evo, very much for being here. Evo is uh, doing uh, a fabulous job of trying to uh, hold the world together and steer us toward an effective agreement, and uh, uh, nothing that I say should take away for one moment from his uh, great leadership in this, and also to underestimate the profound challenge that he faces, and indeed uh, the whole world faces, in finding a way to reach an agreement. I'm not convinced that the current architecture is getting us all that far. That's the, uh, the basic problem. Uh, I think we are making small steps in the right direction, but I don't really see us uh, in the current path as really turning the uh, trajectory as sharply um, and dramatically as we need to do it. I also am not so um, keen on sending our best and brightest uh, off to uh, do more financial market engineering, although there will be a lot of unemployed financial engineers, I suppose, that can do this. But I think the kind of meltdown that we have right now is a little bit of an example of how we've uh, taken a generation of uh, brilliant young people and put them to tasks that really, um, in the end, don't really solve social problems because having a lot of people engineer uh, financial instruments for carbon when there are much more direct ways to do this strikes me as um, not really a, a great investment. So I'm not so keen on the Wall Street approach to carbon, uh, just as I'm not so keen on the Wall Street approach to CDOs and MBSs and ABSs and CDO squares and uh, credit default swaps and all the rest. I think we can simplify this agenda and get uh, more closely to where we need to go. So we're talking basically about architecture because we all agree, and certainly Evo and I agree, that the situation is urgent that carbon emissions uh, need to be constrained sharply, that we're aiming for something like a halving of global carbon emissions by mid-century in a context where the world economy could triple or quadruple given the growth of China and India and Brazil and Africa and uh, other uh, developing regions right now. So the question is how this can be 
brought about. And I think things like the clean development mechanism are just, uh, unfortunately, very small marginal uh, tools that aren't going to really change the broad framework of how energy is produced and how technology is uh, developed and, and uh, distributed. So what are the big architecture questions for the international system? I think the first is the so-called Annex I, non-Annex I distinction. Under Kyoto, the countries that have bound obligations uh, are essentially the high-income countries and the post-communist countries uh, of Central Europe and the former Soviet Union. And the rest of the world can voluntarily take on uh, commitments. I think this is the first piece of architecture that needs to change. It's just unrealistic in my view. I think uh, all countries need to take on commitments, though the commitments for the poor countries need explicitly to make uh, sure and make clear that the commitments are in a context of not only economic growth and development, but actually what I call convergent economic growth and development. That is high growth and development fast enough to significantly and systematically narrow the per capita income gaps with the richer countries. But I think it's a non-starter, for example, to think that China won't have bound commitments in the next round because I don't see how the United States would ever sign an agreement without China having bound commitments, just uh, for lots of reasons. But by the way, in my view, lots of good reasons. It's the world's major emitter. Uh, the emissions are growing dramatically. This problem can't be solved without China. And I don't see CDM as being a way to get China to be making the phenomenal uh, changes that will be needed strategically. And so we're going to need a different kind of architecture, it seems to me. And I believe the basic point is we should end the Annex I, non-Annex I distinction. Of course, common but differentiated responsibilities is a basic principle that I fully subscribe to. But to differentiate by saying that only one part of the world is bound and the other part not, I think is passe at this point. Second is global financing. Whatever is done, poor countries are going to need a lot of resources to do the things they need to do. I don't believe for one moment that a 2% levy on the CDM does, would ever do more than the tiniest fraction of the large scale financing that will be needed. That's financing for all sorts of things, for technology transfer, for implementation, for demonstration projects, for adaptation. I think, in essence, we're going to need a significant pool of international resources, which I think could come from essentially carbon taxation. I'm going to say in a moment whether you auction permits or whether you tax is a kind of fine point in the weeds for me that uh, I think one is better than the other. But in any event, we're going to have to devote, in my opinion, a significant amount of financing, tens of billions of dollars that won't come on the backs of small levies on individual projects, but are going to have to be a dedicated financing system. The third point is mechanisms. Economists love to jump to mechanisms before they jump to reality. Uh, the realities are about what kind of uh, technologies can be deployed, how we're going to produce uh, power in the future, what kind of power plants, what kind of automobiles people will drive, uh, what kind of uh, buildings will be constructed. Economists like to think, but I think it's a fairy tale, that the price signal is the main determinant of those things. Prices matter, they're signals, but prices alone don't determine technology pathways. They don't determine the major rollout of whether you have nuclear power or don't have nuclear power. They don't determine how a national distribution grid, uh, long distance uh, transmission from, of renewables, say from the wind of the northern plain states of the US or from the Mojave uh, solar uh, utilities uh, will reach the rest of the country. Price signals don't do those things. Uh, prices exist in a context of regulation, uh, technology development, subsidy, federal land use, liability law, and so forth. 
and prices by themselves will not transform the scene. And, but economists love this and the financial markets love it even more because they get to make deals and contracts and so on. I just don't see the European trading system as changing the game in technology, for example. If you really want to change the game in technology, you need a technology policy. You need to identify potential options. You need to think about the regulatory liability, public investment, land use, public acceptability, research and development framework. That's a lot, lot bigger than whether there's a $30 price on carbon, which can play a role, but by itself is never sufficient. And it's generally left right now to being by itself, although Evo was very clear to say that there are many instruments needed in this. I just think we jumped to the price far too early. Now there's another big architecture question of whether we're going to have a global system that links a bunch of markets in trading or whether we're going to have somehow national targets. And while one could make uh, some linkages across markets certainly, I actually don't foresee China being part of a global trading system right now. I don't even think it makes sense really for the nature of the Chinese economy uh, to think that a price signal is really going to solve the energy choice question in China given that these are state enterprises with a particular kind of budget constraint, generally a soft one, and one that needs a very different kind of decision making to bring about. So I'm of the view that we're going to have national targets or the EU will have regional targets. There could be some linkages, but I think it is not realistic to think we'd ever have an international trading system. I also don't think it's a very good idea, by the way, and here's basically why. There's very little difference between a tax and a tradable permit from an economic point of view. There are some differences. Evo mentioned price discovery. I don't really see that as, uh, I'd rather not discover the price, I'd rather set the price actually. Uh, I'd rather have a tax that said for the next 20 years we're going to have at least a minimum of X dollars per ton and that that's likely to rise. I don't know what we're discovering because all we're discovering is a demand curve right now. We're not actually discovering what needs to be done by having a certain number of permits. We don't really know and we don't know at what prices uh, certain technology thresholds are going to be passed or not passed. And so it doesn't really strike me as uh, much discovery that we're getting this way. What we need to do is figure out what kind of path is most likely to bring about large scale changes in how we produce electricity, for example. And as I said, price is a piece of it, but so is regulation, R&D, land use, real decisions. For example, in this country, are we going back to nuclear power? What are we going to do about storage of nuclear waste? What kind of transmission system are we going to have if we go for large-scale wind in the Midwest or large-scale solar? Those are big national decisions that are not going to be determined. Same kind of decision, how much are we going to drill offshore, which is, of course, one of the biggest sideshows of uh, energy reality in the world, but is good fodder for political campaign. But those are at least policy decisions. And I think the policy decisions here are really paramount, not the exact mechanism of the price. Now, I, I find the tradable permit system very obtuse, actually. The reason we have it is twofold. One is that it worked well for sulfur oxide in the United States. And that was a good case because there were a few main emitters of sulfur oxide. And you needed a mechanism to get that under control. And there were no sulfur oxide mines to tax. Sulfur oxide doesn't come packaged upstream. So a tradable permit was actually an effective vehicle. The second reason we have it is that the United States is a neurotic country when it comes to taxes. And so President Clinton couldn't mention taxes. So we had to have something that didn't mention taxes. And President Clinton said, this is the most important issue for our children and our children's children, but I'll never support one cent on gasoline.
that's kind of a, the funny situation that got us into Kyoto this way. And then we didn't even sign the Kyoto Protocol in the end, uh, as was already noted. Now, what's wrong with the carbon permit system? What's the breakdown of the analogy uh, with sulfur oxides? First, there is upstream carbon. There are just a few places we get carbon from, coal, gas, and oil. And by taxing upstream, you could choose the refinery level, you could choose the wellhead level. You tax a few places, and you automatically reach a carbon price for the whole economy. If you go downstream, you literally have tens of thousands of enterprises that you're pretending to monitor at very, very high cost, making lots of deals when all you could have done administratively was put the tax upstream and be done with it. And you'd reach all sectors of the economy. So in my view, it's just a bad analogy. If there were an upstream sulfur oxide mine, I'd rather tax that. So I think we just got stuck for funny reasons. Now, I also think we need the revenues. This country is going to have bulging deficits anyway. And everybody's realizing you have to auction the permits. Well, auctioning the permits is like having a tax. It's fiscally similar. The only difference is that with the auction, you don't really know. Supposedly, you're setting a quantity, but all you're doing is setting a quantity for a year or a three-year period. And you're not setting any price on which to make investment decisions over the next 25 years. Whereas with the tax, you set a price path that can affect regulatory decisions out for the foreseeable future. So I don't get it, actually, in terms of mechanisms, but I think this is down in the weeds because I don't really think it's the most important decision. Auctioning permits or taxing strikes me as pretty similar. Not it, but one way is scratching your ear this way, and the other way is scratching your ear that way. And if you really want to get to simple pricing of carbon, put a tax upstream on carbon. You've reached the whole economy simply, administratively, high certainty. You raise revenues, and you don't need that Wall Street uh, set of financial engineers can become real engineers uh, and help figure out how to actually get carbon dioxide under control. So let me skip, because I know I've run out of time, to just the basic recommendations that I would have. First, I think any agreement has to start with the primacy of development as part of sustainable development, because poor countries need to know that the idea is not uh, that there's no longer room at the inn, uh, that the rich countries have filled up the atmosphere and now the poor countries can't grow anymore. That's their biggest fear. And that, I think, is a legitimate fear. And rich countries are not exactly far-sighted, uh, uh, our country not very generous, uh, not paying much attention to the developing world. So the developing world's worried uh, that this is just the way to end their development. And any kind of agreement needs to do something else. So within that context, I believe that we need to set national targets that include everybody, but that build in from the start the idea that developing countries are going to grow a lot more quickly and use a lot more energy than rich countries. And so we set differential paths from the start that build in the idea of convergence in economic development. Third, that we put technological change at the core of this. This is not mainly about turning off the lights. Not that I'm against turning off the lights when you leave the room. This is mainly about what kind of power plants we have, what kind of automobiles we drive, how steel, coal, petrochemicals, uh, cement are produced. Not to take coal out, sorry. I meant to the manufacturing sector, how, how coal, cement, petrochemicals, refineries operate, and how buildings are ventilated. That's what this is mainly about when it comes to carbon. Plus, avoided deforestation, I should quickly add. And that pretty much gets you 95% of the issue that we're talking about. Those are big technological pathway issues. And we should focus on what kind of power systems countries can have, how they can be implemented, 
and national targets should enforce a, uh, should aim for, I should say, uh, we can talk about enforcement later, should aim for a steady reduction of emissions per kilowatt hour for new power plants, but understand that the trading system is, you know, maybe it could do something on the margin, but it's not really going to be the main show for how national power strategies are actually set in the end. You could have tradable permits for power plants, but adding in tens of thousands of smaller enterprises as the European trading system does, or bringing in a million plus Chinese enterprises is really a make work program for absolutely no reason. Because at very, very low administrative cost, you could put the same price through the whole economy, not just through 50% of the economy. And we should understand that this is the thing to do. Finally, we're going to need a lot of revenues. Not a 2% levy on CDM, but something closer to uh, several dollars per ton of carbon emissions for global public goods, for adaptation, for technology transfer, for research and development. There are a lot of details there. I'm gratified that the Swiss government recently proposed a $2 per ton international levy on carbon dioxide. The European Union is talking about devoting a part of its auctioning of carbon permits for these global public goods. Uh, the Norwegian government has come forward with a proposal also to use its auction revenues for this. We need big financing. Putting a price on carbon and taxing it, either through an overt tax or selling these permits, either way, that's going to be the core of the international financing system, not the individual projects. So I think there's a more direct way, and I think there's a way to get the developing countries deeply involved, and I think we need a technologically based approach to a larger extent. We both agree that putting a price on carbon is an important component. I think it carries a weight of a third of the whole strategy, uh, not 90%. And if we're going to do it, let's tax that and subsidize geologic sequestration of carbon and avoid the deforestation. And we'll have a very straightforward, predictable price for the next 25 years. And then we can get on to the real story, which is making the technological transformation. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks very much. Um, we'll go right on to the discussants. I'll first introduce uh, Klaus Lackner. Uh, he joined the faculty <coughs> of Columbia University in 2001, where he is the Ewing uh, Warzel Professor of Geophysics in the Department of Earth and Environmental Engineering. Um, I think of most uh, uh, direct relevance, he's, uh, his research at Columbia University is focused on mineral sequestration, zero emission coal plants, carbon electrochemistry, and the study of large scale energy infrastructures. Dr. Lackner. Thank you very much, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. But I need to start out with an apology. I'm, I'm not bored. I will just run away right after I spoke. And the reason is I have a thesis defense, which is supposed to start in about 15 minutes. So <laughs> I, I'll better show up. Uh, I feel I'm sort of in the middle between these, these two discussion points. Because in a way, I see both sides, and I'll try to make a synthesis to explain where I'm coming from. First of all, the current system is incredibly complicated, and you have heard that. And I would think the, the central theme there is the additionality issue. How do we actually are sure that something happened? And I think there is a crying need to get a lot more simple. And this is what you heard from Jeff. There is some way to do that. And I would furthermore say, the CDM, the M really doesn't stand for markets, it stands for mechanism. And it is a very complicated system with lots of details uh, which need to be worked out and are regulated. What counts and what doesn't count is a very, very complex story. So the second observation I have is, yes, in the next 50 years, we will have to drive down CO2 emissions by maybe a factor of two. But this is still the first step in an even longer journey where we ultimately have to think of that for every ton of CO2 that is emitted, a second ton of CO2 has been put away. We ultimately have to balance carbon emissions against carbon sequestration, or we give up 
on using fossil fuels. These are our choices. So in the end, there have to be very, very drastic reductions, and I believe that it is very difficult to get there without carbon capture and storage. So the first thing, for the sake of simplification, which was, by the way, very implicit in what Jeff said, is we have to get away from this context of greenhouse gases and deal with the problem of carbon. There is a currency exchange rate between what is one ton of CO2 and what is one ton of methane. And there are some arguments what that precise number ought to be, and we can go back and forth. And I would argue to float that currency exchange rate rather than keep it fixed at a particular uh, number and, fi and fix much of our attention on the carbon itself. If you do that, sort of from a science and technology point of view, you're immediately driven upstream <clears throat> because the outcome of digging up a ton of coal, the outcome of getting a barrel of oil out of the ground is essentially that that carbon in those two ends up in the environment uh, and most likely as CO2 in the air. So you have immediately that emission, and that drives you to the permit scheme or the taxing up on the top. But I would argue uh, right upstream at the mine, at the, at the ship coming into the harbor, or even better, at the well, if you can make it happen internationally. So that is the point where you have the permissible act. You mobilize carbon, and that is what you should center on, and that leads you to the tax point of view. But let me add to this one other component. I just told you 85% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. In the last 10 years, the last six, seven years, you have seen an enormous ramp up in price of fossil fuels, not just oil, but also coal, which is essentially driven by a tiny shortfall. Imagine that we can't have any more fossil fuel and what that would do. So it would push you even further and even harder. So I believe the answer without carbon capture and storage is really not possible. But carbon capture and storage puts another wrinkle into the story because it now allows you to trade the sequestration of carbon dioxide, the putting away of carbon dioxide. You dug up a ton of carbon, you have to put another ton of carbon away by some means. And I do believe that collecting the CO2 at power plants, at cement plants, and steel plants is technically feasible, but don't get me wrong, we are not there yet. It's still a long way to go before we do this routinely and on the necessary scale. I have also been working over the last decade, in effect, on collecting carbon dioxide directly back out of the atmosphere. I believe we have technologically solved that problem. Again, it's a far cry from having an economic way of doing this in practice at a field where you can sequester CO2, for example, by pumping it underground. But again, this is another technology which will create a price because there will be a cost to putting that carbon dioxide away. So I actually see an advantage of discovering that price and actually having, a, having that permit be auctioned. It's a wrinkle maybe in the end, but you now have a price, you put it all the way upstream, and it's carbon capture and storage in all its forms, which ultimately will drive that price, and maybe it's the nuclear power. Maybe it's these other things which will end up being the drivers. But here again, I do agree with Jeff that in the end, there will be big policy decisions which have to be made. Are we interested in nuclear energy in solving this problem? Do we focus all the effort we need to focus on developing all of these technologies? We are at a very early stage and industry is usually not terribly good, and commercial markets are not terribly good at finding these big markets and making those decisions. And implicitly, some way or another, policy will have to do that. And so bringing all that money in place, for example, by auctioning permits or having taxes, and then turn around and say, what do we really need to do to solve this problem, is one of those central themes we have to work out. But let me summarize. I do believe it is absolutely critical to drive the pricing, whether it's through taxes or other ways, all the way upstream, because there it's simple. As a matter of fact, our bookkeeping does this already. There is no oil company in the world who isn't taxed for what it took out of the ground. There's no coal company who doesn't have to pay for this. So we know how to attack it that po at that point, and it's simple, and it's only a handful of places. But it will not set the policy whether we go large scale into hybrid cars, 
whether we go to nuclear energy or solar energy and how much we should invest into wind because these are the other questions we will have to answer on a grand scale and there are upfront policy decisions and ultimately the markets can drive it. But carbon capture and storage can set that price because ultimately you are trading a ton of carbon coming out of the ground against a ton of carbon going back into the ground. And that I think is, is a piece which is missing in the current story and it would be very good if it could be added in the post-Kyoto mechanisms. And I'll thank you for your attention and I apologize if I'm out of here in a minute or two. <laughs> Just a very quick question. Uh, what are your views on, um, it's been a, a topic of some discussion over the last couple of years in the negotiations, what are your views on the role of the CCS in uh, the clean development mechanism? Well, I, I do understand why it's not in there yet, right? because it's a complicated thing. People don't trust it yet. I think one of the biggest hurdles uh, CCS will have to overcome is to be acceptable to the public. And But I think as a result, it ought to be seriously put in, not just into the CDM. I think it would be a mistake to just export our problem and tell developing countries, you are the ones who have to worry about having the carbon dioxide under the ground if we don't lead by example and put this also into the mechanisms which work in the developed countries. I think we made a gross mistake. But carbon capture and storage is such an essential theme. If we cannot make that work, and I think, therefore, it has to be incorporated into all mechanisms as one way of reducing emissions. Um, good. Uh, now we'll quickly go on uh, to the last discussant, um, Henry Derwent. Um, he is president and CEO of the International Emissions Trading Association, which brings together over 180 firms across the emissions trading value chain and the world as a whole. In cooperative co collaboration with its members, AIDA promotes the use of intelligently designed trading-based economic instruments to achieve climate objectives with maximum efficiency. Many of you, of course, also probably uh, know uh, Henry as a uh, uh, representative of uh, the British government in the negotiations, and in fact, uh, for over 10 years, uh, he played that uh, very critical role in the UK government uh, in managing the uh, climate change issue. Henry, please. Thanks very much, John, and thanks to uh, Columbia University for organizing this and giving me the opportunity of uh, putting in a couple of comments whose basic uh, outcome, I guess, from the uh, title that I have is predictable, but perhaps some of the points that I can make in response to what we've heard uh, can help uh, the debate along a little bit. Um, as, as John says, I, I used to be um, a policy official in the British government, dealing with uh, both international and domestic climate change. And uh, one of the rather rapidly uh, turning over succession of British government ministers um, just before I went asked me for a briefing about taxation and trading because he'd noticed that in the literature, uh, yeah, politicians do sometimes read literature, uh, and uh, in public debates, there was much more uh, willingness to contemplate a carbon tax. And, and I went over the arguments as best I could, economic arguments um, uh, deriving from the balance of certainty of price outcome and certainty of uh, quantum outcome. And I said there were a lot of good reasons in pure economic theory why a tax would be better. And he heard me out very carefully. And he said, OK, I, I, I hear that. And how would you advise me if I did want to get re-elected? <laughs> and I think that although that may sound like a low blow, it's not an insignificant argument um, given where we are. I, I see, um, not least as a result of what happened yesterday, I see lots of um, proposals for cap and trade appearing, springing up even, um, all over the place uh, across North America and in Congress. I don't see too many tax proposals springing up. Yes, of course, we do have taxation, taxation um, high up the value chain, if you like, um, on petroleum products and so forth. I don't see, I have to say, much in the way of behavioral change being felt down where it matters in the activities 
of those whose demand actually drives the use of these products. We're going to continue to have tax. The question is, given that we don't seem to have addressed the uh, carbon issue successfully through them so far, whether we want to add to them this mechanism of cap and trade. Let me turn to a, a different point that uh, Jeffrey Sachs uh, made, uh, and that is the feeling that the international climate change structure is all wrong, that the difference between Annex 1 and non-Annex 1 is just unrealistic, passe even. Well, I venture to suggest that it doesn't really look that way from the developing world. And I think talking about China here is obviously very, very important from substance, but can get in the way of understanding the nature and the extent of the differentiation that needs to be involved. I'm sure that major developing countries will have to take some form of target uh, in the next round and the rounds thereafter. I'm not at all sure that it will be an economy-wide single constraint that characterizes Annex 1 at the moment. And once you start differentiating, and once you realize that the CDM, a project-based approach, which actually helps economic development, has been good so far and has, needs to be continued, you start saying, well, maybe the differentiation should uh, address uh, the question of how much, what part of an economy, of what period of time uh, one should continue with this successful mechanism before easing some of the participants into a more comprehensive approach. <coughs> Jeffrey Sachs also talked about the need for a great deal of financing. Indeed, I don't know that I entirely agree with uh, Evo's um, figure of 86% of private investment, but whatever it is, just looking at the IEA figures, shows that there is an enormous amount of additional investment expenditure, billions and billions of dollars each year, just to keep emissions where they are at the moment, let alone to get back to a, uh, a 1990 level. And I do not see how that can be done without creating an economic instrument that attracts the attention of the private sector and puts to work the ability of the private sector to find out what the lowest price responses are. There's nothing wrong with destroying industrial gases. The atmosphere doesn't care where precisely uh, a reduction in greenhouse gases comes from, provided that it comes from somewhere. And it makes sense, particularly over recent weeks, to emphasize the point that you need to exert every policy idea you have to search for the lowest cost, at least to begin with, before you go on to the more expensive ones. Prices by themselves, of course, will not do the trick. But I don't think anyone's talking about prices by themselves. As I said, there's a lot of tax out there already. There's a lot of industrial support out there already. But if you think that you can do everything that's necessary by means of taxing and applying that support through government uh, while the private sector bends every sinew to try simply to avoid a taxation burden rather than is tempted by the prospect of profit to try to find cheaper ways of doing it, then, well, you're in a different place from where I am. We do need to discover what prices are. We don't know the price of uh, carbon reduction at all well enough. And to go back to that economic theory that I started my little talk with, um, the economists, I think, are probably uh, wrong to say that this is an issue where price certainty is more important than quantum certainty. We have, as John reminded us, maybe 15, 20 years within which to act. We cannot treat uh, the achievement of a particular quantum of emissions reduction against that background as secondary, something that we can restore next time uh, because we're, we're more interested in the prices. And we can't ignore that, on the whole, our record in terms of pricing pollution uh, response measures. In the UK, I'm a failed civil servant from that perspective, many of our uh, uh, climate change agreement and taxation um, negotiations ended up with numbers which were beaten easily by the private sector. We can't afford to ignore that and say that this time government can actually choose uh, the right winners. Above all, and finally, we need to make sure that we get out of the current discussions, not um, an unrealistic reversion towards, wouldn't it be nice if we were to deal with this by tax, but towards a system 
which creates uh, a world framework for prices. And that is a system which can only, I think, come out of the UN discussions at Copenhagen, hopefully only at Copenhagen. Um, and that will be a place that the rest of the world will look uh, to set uh, the boundaries of a price system or set of price systems which I believe simply have to be part of the mix. Thank you. Um, before we go on uh, and uh, enter into the question period, um, we uh, have allowed some time both for Dr. Sachs and Avo to respond uh, to the points that have already been raised. Um, one thing that I might ask, uh, and a certain fr framing of it, um, both Avo and, and Dr. Sachs, <clears throat> I think one of the <clears throat> more important issues that uh, you raised, Jeff, was the issue of national actions and sort of in the implication that perhaps by s investing too much energy internationally, <clears throat> we may be divesting ourselves of the energy and resources needed to address those national actions. Uh, one of the questions, though, that comes up, and I think it's, a, it's an important point here, but one of the questions that comes up, though, is that if we're just going to have a series of national and regional actions, how do we address the issue of competitiveness? And I think this is one of the big concerns that people have, the cost of CCS, the cost of making the transition that people are calling for in the OECD are so difficult because of the concerns around the issue of competitiveness. But anyways, that's, I, I think, an issue that, that really is important that we uh, address. Evo, did you want to uh, respond? From there? Or from uh, just from here. Yeah, from the chair. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's, it's been very interesting so far. Um, there's a saying in my language, which is Dutch, that um, if you don't respect the small, you're not worthy of the big. And yes, the, the Kyoto Protocol is insignificant in terms of what it has delivered uh, in terms of emission reductions, but it is the first global agreement that has laid an important foundation. And I, I don't think that we need to, um, as you say in this country, necessarily need to dump on the past in order to move effectively uh, into the future. Um, I, I spent my formative years in the United Kingdom and to go to a different language um, and there we used to call a hammer an American screwdriver. Um, <laughs> I, I think that in, in the approach going forward, um, given the complexity of the issue, we're going to need the hammer and we're going to need the screwdriver and the spanner and the wrench and in fact everything that's in the toolbox to uh, to address this, this issue. Um, Jeff said a lot of important things about the characteristics of a future regime on which, in fact, I would agree with him. But I don't think we were really debating uh, the future regime so much. Uh, in that context, I would agree with him that we need to move out of this black and white world of countries with targets and countries without targets and, and move into a much more technicolor world that represents the differentiation that's a reality out there. Um, but that is going to involve negotiation and, and intelligence. And in that context, I actually do see countries like China participating in an international emissions trading scheme. I mean, let me give you an example. Say China or any other developing country had the intention to achieve 20, 30, 40, 50 percent renewable energy um, by 2020 or 2030 or 2040. And they could in attract international capital towards that renewable energy goal by issuing a renewable energy investment bond. Why wouldn't a country like China um, be interested in that? So in that sense, I do actually um, see developing countries participating in trading schemes. In fact, countries, some of them are not really developing countries anymore, like Korea uh, and Mexico are already talking about participating in trading schemes and are already writing that, uh, writing that into to legislation. Um, on, on the question of, of upstream versus downstream, efficiency. Yes, of course, it's much more efficient to, um, to, to tax upstream. But I don't know how the, the oil producing countries that suffer from our national disease, Dutch disease, um, having an oil based economy are going to be respond, going to respond to being the basis for taxation. And in fact, the, the, the people I, I hear squealing most in Europe at the moment about the climate energy package are in fact the upstream uh, energy producers. So I think that that would be a political, a, pol a hard political sell. Work towards it, yes, but a hard sell. At the same time, I, I think it's nonsense to say that you cannot 
regulate thousands of downstream operators. In fact, we are at the moment monitoring and regulating millions of individual companies around the world, not perhaps in terms of their CO2 emissions, but in terms of SO2 emissions, NOx emissions, emissions of particulate, uh, etc. So the infrastructure, um, I believe, is there, but the, but, the, but the efficiency point is valid but tough to get to. Um, finally, the, the Swiss proposal for a global tax, I don't think it's ever going to happen. Um, national taxes, perhaps, but I, I don't see a global tax emerging. But if the global, and it's a pity Dr. Lackner is gone, because if we ever were to get to a global tax that would deliver the kind of technologies that he is talking about, you would actually, through that tax, need to see a tenfold increase in energy prices to get to those kinds of technologies. And to stay in, in Henry's terms, I don't think any politician that proposes a tenfold increase in energy prices is going to get him or herself elected. Okay, thank you. Jeff. I, I think uh, maybe I should clarify a few points. The global tax would not be the tax that on the margin would be providing the incentives. It's not a $50 per ton tax. It's the tax that would be providing the funding for global public goods, including technology transfer, demonstration projects, <coughs> adaptation fund. So the idea of the Swiss $2 per ton is actually to raise revenues from within what countries are doing, not to be the, on the margin the $2 incentive but rather we need global financing, which we don't have right now. The tiny amounts of funding for the adaptation fund or for technology transfers, these are pathetic. Raising funds for anything global right now is pathetic. Uh, strikes me as uh, um, uh, therefore, uh, and everything is politically hard, by the way, so I, I'm not sure what's politically easier or politically harder. The idea of developing countries coming into the trading system because they can sell tens of billions of dollars of bonds, well, that's obvious why they'd be interested. It's also the reason why the U.S. is not going to be interested in such a system. We're not going to be financing China implicitly or explicitly tens of billions of dollars if we're going to be financing China, it's going to be explicit. It's not going to be by saying China has vast rights to emit and we have vast constriction on emission. Now we'll pay huge, huge amounts for uh, China's rights. Talk about politically unreasonable. That's the mythology that underpins some developing country ideas of how this is all going to work out, that they're big bonanzas of financial transfers that are going to come implicitly. Wait for that congressional vote. Somebody's going to realize that. I'll tell you just an interesting article that was written, but I, you could mention a thousand times this conversation. Mitt Romney, during the primary, came out for a carbon tax. Why did he do it? Because he said, if we go with the tradable permit system, we're going to be transferring huge amounts abroad. A tax is going to stay at home. Great argument actually correct. And so, not that money doesn't have to go abroad, but what Congress sends abroad is going to be known what it's sent abroad. It's not going to be a hidden tens of billions of dollars of transfer from rich to poor countries. Maybe in Europe, but not in the United States. This is a country that is not so generous and uh, is not so forthcoming on those principles as many European countries are. And so that's actually going to stop it right from the start. And I think, therefore, what I mean about China participating in a trading scheme being very unlikely was something else. Not their desire to, re to get tens of billions of dollars of flows. I meant the reality of monitoring hundreds of thousands of Chinese enterprises. That strikes me as wildly off base uh, and not possible, actually especially given that these are state enterprises to an important extent, which don't have the same kind of budget constraints. Our private sector doesn't even have those budget constraints either, we understand, uh, as of the last uh, month. But 
The idea that this is going to be driven through permits, I think, is wrong. It's interesting. <coughs> Look, the idea whether you're selling a permit or whether you're putting on a tax is to raise the carbon price. And the ultimate incidence is the, of this is relatively the same. That's what basic economics tells you. It doesn't really matter how you do it. But if you do it upstream, it's a few places to do it. It's simple. It's direct. If you do it downstream, you think you're actually hiding something. But in the end, nothing's going to be hidden, especially when those permits start being auctioned. The reason that the idea now is get the foot in the door, we give everybody grandfathered permits. Wait till they start to be auctioned to see how the vision of this process with the uncertain financial liability year after year is going to come into this system. Then it's going to be realized that these are basically the same things, but one is predictable in terms of price and the other is not predictable. One is administratively easy to deliver. One is extraordinarily difficult to deliver. I bet in the end reality will prevail. Now you said also, was uh, Henry said, that uh, he didn't notice a lot of American politicians uh, talking about tax increases. He's absolutely correct. Our country is neurotic, as I said, when it comes to, to taxes. However, we also have a gaping fiscal deficit. It's about to explode, by the way, to maybe $800 billion next year. We're going to see red ink, the likes of which has never been recorded in absolute magnitudes when the combination of our financial meltdown and this miserable under taxation in this country uh, and a recession all get acknowledged next year. You'll never have seen the budget deficits coming. So we're actually going to grow up a little bit and start talking about taxes again in this country because we're trying to run a country without taxation and we just went broke doing it. We tried to run it without personal saving and we tried to run it without government taxation. Now we've hit the wall. We haven't yet discussed these things, but we will discuss them in this country. And then a price on carbon is not going to look so bad because taxing the bad rather than taxing the good is going to become a good political argument as well. So my own personal view is I learned a long time ago, don't take what's politically, accept, uh, what's politically possible at face value. Think about what the right thing to do is. And if something's vastly easier, vastly more straightforward, recommend that because the, the politics around that will turn out to be better in the end than going the indirect way, which you think is going to trick a lot of people, but in the end is going to be stopped because we're not going to buy from China these permits. We're not going to transfer large money abroad. We're not really going to auction them this way to happy campers upstream. It's all going to come down to the same thing. It's a price. Someone's going to have to pay for it. So collect it where it's predictable, easy, and upstream. OK, thank, thanks, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> I invite people to start coming up to the microphone. I will also be filling some questions that we've been receiving uh, virtually. Um, if I might, uh, I'll take the chair's prerogative here and uh, ask the first question, and I'll re-ask my question. Um, the whole issue, and I think it's a very fascinating one because uh, certainly in Canada we have that argument very much, particularly in the province of Alberta, which argues that, listen, our big problem is technology, and we really have to put all of our investments and all of our attention and focus on that particular technology, in this case with the oil sands and the fact that they're coal-based, it needs to be CCS. We shouldn't be squandering our money and sending it overseas for what is often called some questionable uh, uh, reductions overseas, uh, doesn't really get to our problem, as it were. So, I, Evo, I'd like you to address that issue. But Jeff, on your side, uh, in, in other words, to be more clear, does in fact too much of a reliance, and we've already seen some Southern European countries, Italy, Spain, etc., we're not really seeming to do a heck of a lot domestically, but appearing to do a heck of a lot in terms of their Spanish carbon funds or, or other such things, instead of actually taking actions at home. So, so is that an issue as you see it as it's developing? But Jeff, on your side, how do you deal with this competitiveness issue? Yep. Because how significant a price, for example, was Governor, Governor Romney talking about? And would it have, in fact, made any difference? And if it had, wouldn't it immediately then get into that whole storm of carbon leakage? Yep. So, Abel and Jeff. OK. Uh -huh. My guess right now, by the way, looking at what we know from really a 
very large uh, number of good recent studies is that a price on the order of uh, $50 a ton carbon dioxide, maybe up to $75 a ton, is in the range that could bring on a lot of technological change if it's combined with uh, major efforts on all of the regulatory, uh, the land use, the public acceptance, the uh, R&D, the demonstration side. So if we made major efforts and added on something on the order of 50 dollars to 50 euros roughly uh, in terms of uh, price per ton, we'd be in a realistic range. And can we that, do that unilaterally? And, and that's the kind of policy implicitly I think we should be aiming for. Uh, now implicitly I mean in the following sense. I think China should take on bound national level uh, agreements. I actually don't even see how we're going to progress politically in this country. Uh, nervous enough about China, all of a sudden going to be binding our industry with China not. I don't believe it for one moment. China is the big uh, question, of course, in all of this, but it's not the only one that's going to come up politically in this country, and I think it's already in Europe as well, a growing issue once this regime starts to really bite. So how can you do that? Complicated. But basically, if you put on standards or binding targets for five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years that reflect the kinds of technologies that are available right now and aggressively develop new technologies, demonstrate them, and then tighten up the targets over time so that the kinds of technological pathways you're talking about essentially are at $50 per ton or less for transformation, like hybrids, which could be net saving, of course, uh, like uh, green buildings, like CCS, which is probably a $30 to $50 ton after the demonstration phase, like, uh, uh, well, I, you know, many kinds of uh, power, uh, uh, many kinds of power uh, plant choices. If the national targets respect uh, technolo technological realities, so that the amount that you're squeezing, in fact, in the transformation is based on what you really have in hand, not just saying we're limiting for the sake of limiting, but you're aiming to limit with what's close at hand, and you tighten that grip over time, then you may, and countries that would then implement that, by the way, by putting in a tradable permit system or they'd implement it by a tax system, you could support that by many mechanisms. I'd argue to be efficient, supported upstream. And by the way, footnote in the digression, yeah, I don't think OPEC's going to love this, but I wouldn't tax them upstream. I would tax as the tanker arrives at the refinery in this country. That would be our upstream tax. So my point is uh, that you'd implicitly set a price, maybe even explicitly set a price. Countries would have tradable systems. Europe's going to have this, whether I like it or not. Uh, it's going to auction. Maybe we're going to have it whether I like it or not, although I think it's a funny way to proceed. But in any event, we're going to see prices and we're going to be operating in a mix where there is a carbon price in different markets, maybe even trade among them. I, that's, that's fine. No, no problem on the margin with that. But the core of it is going to be binding commitments that force technological changes to technologies with, with technologies which are within reach with a very aggressive technology development system and tightening those standards over time as CCS gets proved, as plug-in hybrids get proved, as uh, other kinds of low emission technologies get proved. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Evo, the other side of the issue. Um, I don't know if it's the other side, but, but very briefly. Um, Yes, we need developing country engagement, but, but please, please bear in mind, and you know all of this, that the bulk of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that are there at the moment are there because of industrialized countries, not because of developing countries. Yes, China and India are economic powerhouses of the world, but their per capita emissions are a fraction of what they are in industrialized countries. In India alone, there are 400 million people, 400 million people that don't even have access to electricity. So yes, 
we need to engage developing countries, but we need to respect the differences. And we need to um, recognize that the convention, the climate change convention that everyone, including the United States, signed, obliges developing countries to undertake policies and projects to limit the growth of their emissions, providing developed countries help out with finance and technology. So yes, they need to engage, but they need to be helped to engage. Can you achieve that help in engagement in an acceptable way politically and socially? I think so, yes, providing you also differentiate there. I think that China is way beyond um, the, 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 the state of needing anybody else's money to advance. I think, in fact, that China is financing the American national debt, not the other way around. Exactly. Um, so I don't think that, that China um, needs the money. I also don't think, and there's a very interesting study on border tax adjustments from, uh, from the World Resources Institute that, that looked at, at competitive distortions and looked at imposing border taxes on Chinese steel coming into the American market. The conclusion of that study was that, you, that there's only 1.6% of Chinese steel coming into the US market and that you would not affect that, American, that Chinese steel with a border tax because generally Chinese steel is produced more efficiently than American steel. The only people that would suffer from an American border tax on steel would be the Canadians, John, and the Mexicans. Um, and I don't know if that, if, that the, if that would be the goal. I think that there are possibilities to, to work together with countries like China. Jeff, you were talking a lot about carbon capture and storage, as was Mr. Lackner. That is an essential part of the uh, of the future of coal-based economies. If you could export American coal technology to China and top up the extra costs through government-to-government -government cooperation, you would be exporting an American technology that does nothing to change the competitive advantage or disadvantage of China. So that would, there, I think, you know, there are creative ways that, that, we, can, uh, that we can find in, in, in terms of moving forward there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Henry, did you want to add any comment, particularly just on the issue again of, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the flexibility mechanisms as a means of actually taking away resources and focus from uh, uh, critical national actions that need to be taken, uh, particularly in OECD countries? Well, on that point, um, I, I think it's a question of preserving the balance between uh, doing what's necessary to change the economy of developed countries and uh, fit them for a low carbon future and not spending so much money on that in ignorance uh, or uh, willful ignorance of the availability of uh, lower cost means of achieving the same in terms of carbon uh, reduction elsewhere. Uh, I think that the best way uh, of using or seeing the clean development mechanism is as a means of offsetting costs which are properly incurred, at least in this first stage, by developed countries in order to smooth the path, uh, which is often a very bumpy when we're talking about large uh, capital kit that needs to be invested in here, to smooth the path towards a developed country, a low carbon transformation. Um, and while that path is being smoothed, you can make use of emissions reductions possibilities which are very clearly there, very clearly um, lower cost, can be made very clearly environmentally uh, acceptable and are definitely beneficial to the economies of the developing countries. Don't forget what Nick Stern's um, calculations of total GDP impact of uh, combating climate change are based on. Don't forget what the IPCC's similar calculations are based on. They're based on a global trading system, making use of the cheapest opportunities around the world. Only if you do that do you start getting the acceptable levels of world GDP cost that uh, people are quite rightly talking about as a reason for actually doing something rather than just retreating and putting our heads in the sand. Okay, thank you very much, Henry. Why don't I open it to the floor? Thank you all for your patience. I'll be fielding some questions from offline, but or, or that are online, excuse me. But first, here, please. And could you introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Pedro Sanchez. I work in uh, tropical agriculture here at the Earth Institutes. Um, obviously, the, all the mitigation ideas, none of them are, are <clears throat> they have to be many of them. It's sort of 
one may help 10%, my, one may help 5%, one may help 25%, and, and, and so on. Uh, but the things that you haven't talked about is uh, the uh, carbon uh, sequestration uh, potential by agriculture and forests. And after all, photosynthesis is the main way we sequester carbon from the atmosphere and uh, that we also plants and ourselves respire it away too. Uh, I am delighted. That's what I heard from the Bali meeting now that uh, avoided deforestation is agreed to. Mm -hmm. uh, there's tremendous potential, primarily in the tropics, for major carbon sequestration through trees on farms, agroforestry. It could, it could probably sequester about three, an average of three uh, tons of C, not CO2, per hectare per year, which is about 10 times what uh, a good Iowa field here could sequester. My question uh, to you and, and everybody else is, is what, what are your visions for, for this, this part of the, of the equation? Thank okay, you. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll field a, a couple of questions. I <clears throat> have an interesting one from uh, the Environment Defense Fund. Uh, James Wang, he notes that, uh, uh, and it's a question that uh, came out to, from another questioner as well, <clears throat> how in fact uh, these project-based mechanisms, particularly the clean development mechanisms, uh, almost uh, become a, um, uh, it's a, a counterintuitive result in that uh, it's become so attractive to India and China and some of the other major countries, Brazil, as, a <clears throat> as an inducement uh, for reductions. Um, that it will make it very difficult for them to make, it will make it, make it that much more difficult for the transition to actually taking on targets eventually because now they're getting paid positively for making reductions and we're now asking them to go into a regime of targets where in fact they will no longer be paid and it will actually be penalized from a target perspective. So um, that, um, uh, the question being, are the Kyoto mechanisms actually delaying uh, commitments uh, from uh, developing countries in, in taking on actions? And why don't we take one more from the floor? I think you were standing and introduce yourself. Sure. Um, my name is Kyle Mung, and I'm a PhD student in the Sustainable Development Program here. And my question is for uh, Mr. DeBoer, and it also has to do with the uh, CDM. Um, I'm, I appreciate the amount of time you spent talking about it and the emphasis on issues with additionality. Uh, another question I have about the CDM, which I feel has been less discussed about, is the uh, what I describe as the, the net zero effect of the CDM, which is that at best the CDM really just allows um, the developed world, the Annex One nations, to offset its emissions reductions obligations uh, and transfer those emissions to the developing world. In other words, there are, uh, as a result of which uh, there are no net reductions. So in the context of the post-2012 discussions, in the context of the IPCC findings, we should talk about a peaking of global emissions in the next 10 or 15 years. How is CDM or even expansion of this mechanism and this kind of uncapped trading really going to be compatible with a climate safe future and what your thoughts are on that within this current discussion going up to Copenhagen? Okay, thank you. Uh, gentlemen, I'm going to start. Abel? Um, well, I'm sorry I didn't talk about deforestation, but that's because we were supposed to be talking about taxes versus trading. Um, I absolutely agree that deforestation has to be an essential part uh, of the puzzle as we, as we go forward since it accounts for 20% for of global emissions. And I think that there are possibilities to bring deforestation or stopping deforestation uh, also under a market-based uh, approach. And it's very important that we, um, that we, that we do that. In, on the question of countries now being paid, developing countries now being paid to, to take targets and um, um, that changing into the future. I, I, I think it's important that even under the current Kyoto regime, there are a number of industrialized countries, including Spain, Portugal, Greece, Ireland, Australia, that actually have emissions growth targets under the Kyoto Protocol, not emission reduction uh, targets. I get the sense that, that many developing countries, including China, India, Brazil, Mexico, South Africa, and some smaller ones are without anybody's help already acting on climate change and already willing to do what is maximally possible to them within economic parameters. To go beyond that, to go beyond that, I think that they will continue to need international help. 
So I can foresee a situation whereby a developing country does what it can do on its own and then deviates below that on the basis of, uh, of, of, of international assistance and international cooperation with differentiation uh, amongst countries according to the level of the economic development. On the, on the CDM leading to a net zero reduction, um, that's true, but it's also not true. It's true in the sense that if you emit a ton of CO2 in your company or country, you can compensate that with a ton of reduction through the CDM, and the end result is zero. But I think it's important to bear in mind that countries and companies are deploying, are deploying this instrument in the context of an emission reduction target. So even if a company with, say, a 10% reduction target emits 10% more because it has bought 10% of CDM credits, it still, either through the CDM or through in-company action, has to reduce another 10% to get to its target. So yes, it's a zero-sum game, but because of the reduction targets, it's also not a zero-sum game. Sure. My sense is that we're going to need large-scale financial transfers from rich countries to poor countries to make uh, this whole uh, transformation work. The nature of those transfers is going to uh, be uh, in many dimensions for adaptation, for demonstration projects, for technology adoption that where the technology is more expensive than an emitting technology, but it is less expensive either than the carbon tax price or the permit price, which ostensibly reflects the social value of uh, abatement. So there are many transfers that need to be done. There are a couple of visions of this. One is that this happens in a very uh, decentralized way. Uh, partly through implicit transfers that come about through allocations of rights, partly through this uh, mechanism of purported, maybe hopefully actual additionality in CDM projects and so on. None of this impresses me as being coherent enough to actually, and big enough to actually bring about the scale of change that we're really talking about here. We're talking about a tremendous transformation of the world's energy system, the kinds of ways we produce power, the cars that we drive, the ways that some of the biggest industries in the world, and I'll mention them again, petrochemicals, refining, steel, and cement operate, and the nature of buildings. I don't think this very diffuse way works. I also don't believe that the hidden transfer approach or the ideal approach that you'd find in an academic paper that says everybody has the right to an equal number of emissions per capita and those who do more like the United States will pay so that there's an equal amount per capita is actually uh, a way to find an agreement either. What I do believe is there's going to be need to be quite transparent about all of this. Who's actually paying whom? How much? How big are the commitments? How big are the costs? In which ways are they going? That's what I believe is going to be needed. Not hidden ways or highly decentralized ways picking pieces here and there. That's my own view because we're dealing with the scale of transformation and with a project that's 40 years long. So in that case, we should get to the core of the issues. Now to do that, for example, means that India and China are completely different in their circumstances, as Evo said. China's considerably wealthier. Uh, it is much larger emissions per capita. India is considerably poorer, much lower emissions per capita they're going to be treated quite differently. And so too will a Brazil and a Bolivia or sub-Saharan Africa, which doesn't even have energy outside of basic uh, local biomass and human uh, effort, uh, even in places without animal traction. But being transparent and systematic is possible. 
My own view, and I'll, some, I'll just stop here, is that the way this will work out in the end is that rich countries will help poor countries to undertake transformations to clean energy systems. I think solar, for example, is a major way forward on a very large scale, very large scale, in the Sahel or in the Sahara or uh, in the Atacama Desert for a lot of, uh, 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 for a lot of uh, South America or in the Gobi. Okay, without going into more detail, those are big technological transfer and, uh, I'm sorry, big technology issues. The rich countries are going to have to help finance those, in my opinion, because they're more expensive, though cheaper when we take into account the, the costs of climate change than not, but they're more expensive than plain vanilla energy technologies. For the middle income countries, I don't believe the United States and Europe are going to spend huge amounts on China. I don't believe it. But I think the deal will come down for China to say, look, we have to share in the technologies. That's what we're interested in. We need the technologies. And we're not going to go with an IPR regime in which we're paying also huge royalties for these technologies. And you filled up the atmosphere before. That's ridiculous. And you, you're not even doing the technologies on your own. So I can understand China's point of view. But I don't believe we're actually going to say a different kind of argument that says, we did all of this for the last 200 years. Now we're also going to make hundreds of billions of dollars of transfers to you because that's fair. That may be fair. Many of us could believe that's fair. I don't believe that's going to be the basis of the international system going forward. So what I'm recommending is we understand how large scale the transformations needed are. We don't get ahead of ourselves in committing to things which would break the economy, meaning we don't commit to reductions that are so strong that the technologies are not available for them. We keep in a range implicitly of $50 per ton or less. Okay. Maybe you could say 50 euros per ton or less. But we understand where the financial transfers are really going to be needed, where they're not going to be needed. We take that up front. And then we mobilize financing, I think, through direct carbon taxation, or if Europe prefers, sell the permits, and then give a part of that for the global financing of this whole effort. Right, thank you. <clears throat> um, we have quite a lineup coming here. Henry, did you have any quick comment on uh, any of the? Yes, very quickly, please. A, a, sentence, a sentence each. Sure. Um, on biosequestration, hugely important. Also, I'm glad to say, photogenic and attractive to companies and politicians alike, which means the proposals for creating reduction unit methodology are coming forward thick and fast, and it's the private sector and the voluntary market, actually, which is putting ideas forward. They need to be responded to um, by the CDM system and so forth, but I think it's developing in the right way. CDM so attractive that developing countries uh, don't want to move away from it. Well, hey, there's a problem of success if you like. And I think th the first point to say is that we needed that because without there being an economic involvement, those developing countries would be a long way further back from seeing that they had an interest in uh, carbon reduction than they are at the moment. The point is now, and this is the purpose of the negotiations, to make them understand that they're going to have to run a little harder and a little harder in order to get that benefit. And I covered how that should happen in my remarks earlier. And finally, uh, a zero-sum game. Uh, well, yeah, it's a zero-sum game if you'd like to look at it that way. But in terms of cost, it's not. It's the same amount of reduction at a lower cost, which means that those who set the emissions targets can get away with pushing further because it doesn't cost so much. Thank you very much, Henry. And uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, if you could introduce yourselves. And also, please try and keep the questions to the point and as short as possible. Sure. Uh, Roman Kramarczuk. I'm with Pyra Energy Group. Uh, my question is, I think we all recognize large amounts of revenues that would come either from a tax or from an auction. Now, like Dr. Sachs had said that this would be a key source of funds for investment in clean energy. At the same time, there is this budget deficit. And at the same time, if you look at the Canadian elections, the Liberals are proposing giving it back to the taxpayers. 
So this kind of comes to one of the key issues with taxes is that is there really a certainty that the taxes will be employed in the way that people consider that they should be employed? And this once again comes to the point of if, if you are collecting these revenues, are, is the investment really being made by the people most likely to engage in smart, clean investment? Or is there a concern that this money will be diverted or used in other ways that are not going towards these goals? And I think one of the key examples here is the ETS, um, ETS versus non-ETS sectors in Europe, where there is some certainty that you will hit, hit the ETS targets in, in terms of uh, emissions, but there really is no certainty outside of the ETS targets. Um, the non-ETS sectors, the transport, the, res the ResCom sector, that those targets will be met. All right, thank you. Please. Uh, I'm a financial engineer that uh, I guess Dr. Sadix referred to in the beginning, having done enough CDO squares and actually CDO cubes as well. Okay. Uh, this Could you go question. closer to the mic, please? Sure. This is more of a question for Avo and for Henry. Um, I guess the uh, carbon credits generated from the clean development uh, mechanisms, uh, if you look at the statistics of the UN publication in 2007, they're actually quite important. The carbon market was about 60 billion of which up to a fifth to a sixth of it actually comes from the developing countries, the non-NX1 countries, carbon credits. My question to you is the following. Number one is obviously we're gonna have a global major slowdown. Secondly, oil has gone from a height of $147 to about 88. Thirdly, we're gonna have massive counterparty risk. I was shocked, for example, to see that the UN-sponsored carbon fund the carbon banker was actually Fortis. Fortis is right. the national Right. Could we, the question, please? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, given that euro um, carbon has been trading at about 8 to 12 euros last year, is there a point where these clean development mechanism uh, projects are not going to work because the price is too low? Thank you. Uh, please? <clears throat> um, uh, my name is Bhatt Jarhal. <coughs> I'm from our remote intellectual organization, Glasgow Office in New York. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Urgent Institute for organizing this very important discussions, uh, inviting each uh, secretary of UNHCC uh, before Poznan conference. Just one question, and uh, uh, Mr. Pivar mentioned about market-based approach. And uh, the carbon is not uh, good for everyday life and for the advertisement and for trading uh, system. There should be some market signal or some driving factors. And my question is, uh, what uh, would be very important, the government uh, political will or scientific recommendations in saving of uh, carbon or carbon emissions? Sorry, are you, are you clear on the question? I'm sorry, could you, uh, okay, thank you, please. Good morning, my name is Anand Apalingam. I'm a CDM development consultant based in uh, East Africa. Uh, I have a question in two parts. First for Dr. Sachs, he focused very much on, on upstream, upstream reforms, upstream taxation. 99% of the projects that come across my desk are biomass and biogas related. So for biomass, clearly that's, you know, substitution of HFOs, petrodiesel. For the bio, biogas projects, that's all, all methane reduction. Uh, if we were to follow your, your program, you know, I'd see the pins coming to me drop by a tremendous amount. Uh, my second question goes to, to Mr. DeBoer. All these biomass and biogas projects are typically under, under five to eight megawatts. Now the transaction costs involved in CDM make those projects individually, you know, just financially unviable. What we need to really get these things together and to bring some real investment into Sub-Saharan Africa is a good approach to programmatic CDM. What's your, your plan for bringing that forward? Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then finally here, and then I have a couple of offline questions too that are related. Hello, my name is Will Bates, and I'm the, one of the coordinators of a new global initiative called 350.org. And my question is regarding um, this number 350. Uh, as it becomes incre increasingly clear that the safe upper limit of CO2 in the atmosphere is lower than previously thought and actually below our current levels, will that alter, in your, in your, from your perspectives, will that alter the, the mechanisms that we're actually implementing to solve this crisis, or is it purely going to be a matter of strengthening those mechanisms and making them, uh, and, and, and sort of extending them to a long-term trajectory to get us below this 350 parts per million uh, level of CO2 in the atmosphere? 
All right. Thank you. Um, interestingly enough, uh, we've received a number of queries uh, through the webcast uh, from Rwanda, from Kenya. Um, there's a lot of, and also uh, from Canada, um, a lot of concerns about the fiscal crisis and its implications uh, for the global trading system, but also even more importantly, I think, for addressing climate change. And I think that there would be some uh, interest uh, amongst uh, them in how, you, what you think the implications are, both in terms of financing in the market, but also in terms of as we're heading closer to an agreement at Copenhagen. And I think we're all in agreement about the fact that at Copenhagen, financing is going to be a huge part of that deal. With this kind of crisis going on, how realistic is it to expect that, in fact, some real financing uh, can be provided? Um, <clears throat> there's also. Um, uh, the question out of Rwanda was very interesting, and it brings to my mind the fact that I'm not sure I would have had a question from Rwanda before if it hadn't been for the CDM um, about what opportunities there are to generate carbon credits, uh, the, the role of afforestation and deforestation in carbon credits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and, and I guess the, the question being again, could one foresee a situation, and I know that there's been talk about this as well, where in the future, in terms of the, the, the further differentiation of countries, we have a CDM that is really intended and focused on LDCs, and we have some kind of different sorts of mechanisms when it comes to the more major developing countries. Um, we have about 15 minutes left, but or actually, ooh, it's only 12 now. Uh, Evo, to you first. Okay, well, I'll be, I'll be really fast. I'll, I'll take the question on, on low price and, and political will together. Um, I think I would agree with Jeff if that's what he said, that, that achieving a price is, is, is not the goal, it's the result of something. And I think that, that what we need in moving forward is, is the, the political will to put a mix of policy instruments in place, including taxes, trading, uh, and regulation, that will drive investments in a certain direction and, and create the price. So without the political will and without the price, be it a, a an end product or not, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to get there. Um, yes, transaction costs in the clean development mechanism are high. Yes, we're looking at sectoral approaches uh, or programmatic CDM, as you called it. In fact, I think in a future regime, you might actually be, be looking at an approach whereby a whole sector of the economy is addressed and somehow brought under some kind of international uh, regime. The, um, the th then the, the 350 parts per million and the financial crisis, uh, I think that the financial crisis is going to have a huge impact uh, on the negotiations as they, they move forward, that it's going to influence the availability of capital, the willing to, willingness to spend and the ability to spend towards a climate change regime. And in that sense, you know, sometimes I say that Cl Copenhagen is too close. In that sense, I'm, I'm quite happy that it's far away uh, in the hope that something will at least have improved uh, uh, a little bit by the time we get to Copenhagen, because money is an essential part of the solution. And finally, on the least developed countries and, and different regimes, um, both Jeff and I talked about differentiated approaches to different countries. Yes, I think we will, need, um, we will need different approaches for different countries depending on their level of income, depending on the late nature of their economy, which is why at the end of my introduction I talked about different horses for different courses, and it's very important that we target how we function. Okay, thank you. Jeff? <coughs> One of the reasons why we don't have uh, the political will right now is that there isn't a very clear perspective in most countries, and especially, I'd say, or not especially, but including the United States, of what all this means. Does this mean breaking the back of the economy? How could we get the uh, reduced emissions? Does this mean more unemployment? And so without a framework that steps away from the mechanism for a moment and talks about the real economy uh, in operations uh, uh, programming. You, in theory, you talk about the primal and the dual. The dual is what prices support in equilibrium. The primal is what actually is going to happen physically. People don't understand that at all. They don't understand what we're talking about to actually reduce emissions. Is this? And if it's explained in terms of the kind of power plants we have, the kind of automobiles that we drive, the feasibility of carbon capture and sequestration, how an actual trajectory could work, we'd be vastly farther along 
than simply debating whether we're going to have permits or taxes. Both of those look scary to people because they don't understand what's the point of where we're really going. How much is it going to cost in economic terms? How much am I going to pay? What does it mean for my industry? And I think we are at risk of missing the beat. I know in this country we are because we don't even have a discussion. What could a U.S. transformation mean? So we're way ahead, and that's because we've had no leadership in this country for eight years on this. And so we've wasted our time completely when we should have been talking about these things. Now, one other, and that's how we're going to get the political will, is to have a strategy. Then mechanisms will come behind that. How do you support that strategy? But that comes way later, in my opinion. The other, the economist view that we put a price and then the strategy reveals itself in the marketplace is just naive for the kind of transformations we're talking about. When we're talking about a heavily regulated environmental impact utility sector, when we're talking about the auto sector, which is different, that's why we have standards in the auto sector everywhere in the world. It's not just the price that determines these things. Okay. With, with regard to East Africa, now let me say very clearly without meaning to uh, offend anybody, the global climate issue is not going to be determined one way or another in East Africa under any circumstances at all. That's why we're not spending our time right, period, in this. East Africa, that's where I spend all my waking hours worrying about. Let me be clear, so I don't want to make it sound like I don't care. It's exactly the opposite. This is no way to approach the issue of East African development. For East African development, we need to think about creating a power system. What kind is it going to be? Who's going to pay for it? Because East Africa can't pay for it on its own. OK, within that, what role for biomass is a good question. But we're taking it completely upside down to start with the idea of the climate change regime in East Africa. East Africa is desperately poor, has almost no electricity, and needs economic development. Let's start there. And then we'll have a much clearer idea. And the money that needs to be transferred is not through CDM deals. The money that needs to be transferred is large-scale development to help build a power system. For instance, that solar power grid that I talked about. This is where we let mechanisms get way ahead of reality. Reality is much different from this, and it requires a systemic view of infrastructure, of infrastructure, because that's what real development has to sit upon. And it's not going to be done by very small projects. So I like biomass and biogas, and if there's a tax eventually or a differential price between sectors, someone will come to this. But in terms of strategy, that's not where we need to start. Good. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Henry, before I give it to you, there's one last question quickly here, and then, um, and then I will also allow for closing comments. Please. Hi, my name is Stacy. I'm working with um, UNDP. Talking to the mic. Yeah, Sorry. You. My name is Stacey Alboer. I'm working with UNDP specifically to support their role in the Global Gender and Climate Alliance. Over the past few years, there's been growing recognition that men and women are being impacted differently from climate change. And I'm, we've noticed there's been a lot of recognition that the financing mechanisms globally are not really responsive to women's needs and it's hard for women to access them. So I was wondering what you would suggest as far as ways to make the global financing mechanisms more accessible to women. Okay, thank you. Very interesting question. Um, Henry, why don't I allow you uh, to start here, and then I'll give it to Jeff, and then uh, Evo will uh, allow to conclude. Henry? Okay, well, I guess it's um, sensible for me to try to take some of the market and um, financial crisis-related questions. Um, and I think implicit is, is a, a question, are the global carbon markets going into meltdown? Well, actually, no. Um, price of uh, EUAs is uh, is holding up uh, really pretty well, and the price at which um, 
uh, CERs from the CDM that actually trade on the market is uh, as close to uh, the price of the EU um, instruments as it's ever been. There's not much difference that the market is, uh, is, is identifying there. Uh, there are, as you might expect, quite a lot of things happening um, to some of the market players involved. Some buyers and sellers are going broke. Um, some uh, positions which have been taken um, where people really wanted to be long on some carbon instruments, they are trying to get rid of them if they possibly can. They're certainly not adding to them. But it's worth remembering that um, the major market here is a compliance market. Um, and of course, you can say that as a result of financial circumstances, governments in the next round of setting compliance targets are going to be less ambitious than they were. And that may or may not happen. You can see some evidence of that in some places. Um, but it's longer term, and it doesn't affect the need for companies who are still in there to actually satisfy their compliance obligations, either through, in the EU context, EU allowances, or by drawing on the, uh, on, on the CDM market as, as well. Um, there is, of course, a bit of a, a ghoulish silver lining here. Um, reduction in economic activity on the whole still reduces carbon a little bit. Um, so there's lots of ways in which this isn't just um, the sort of market which you would expect to be at the very riskiest end of a financial movement and therefore to be collapsing at first. The point about diversification, which has been one of the reasons why people are interested in the carbon market, is still there. As for it being high risk, yeah, we, we always knew that, which is one of the reasons why you have to make sure that there are the prospects of profit to keep people in there over the medium term. Uh, I think I will um, stop there. Uh, I can't resist a, a, an answer to the very last question, or rather a, a batting away in a different uh, direction. Um, I think that there are plenty of methodologies available uh, which um, could uh, within the CDM, which could um, respond to women's needs in a variety of CDM places, but that's essentially for the executive board uh, to give them special um, attention uh, when they come before them uh, through uh, the mechanism of methodologies coming before the EB in the normal way. Okay, thank you, Henry. Uh, Jeff, you have about a minute or two. The uh, gender issues in Africa are profoundly important, and they are not the purview of the board of the CDM. This is the problem. Let's try to keep some things clear, and this is not how we're going to do carbon change. It's not how we're going to do large-scale transformation to save the planet, nor is it how we're going to help desperately poor, hungry African women. There's development which needs its agenda, especially in the poorest places. There's climate change. This attempt to make these linkages down in this way is not right. It's just getting us way off course and spending our time in the wrong directions. Your issues are first-rate issues, but not through the CDN. Thanks. Jeff, did you have any uh, quick closing comment as well? In terms of uh, the financial crisis, just a, a word, I think it's going to make it much harder to get an agreement on the general principle that businesses in Europe and the United States are going to say, on top of this, you're putting on higher burdens, we're trying to stay alive. And this is most unfortunate, but it comes from the idea that what we're talking about up here is all pain or technical transfers of assets or uh, these uh, kinds of uh, mechanisms as opposed to scoping out how we're going to um, actually help save the planet by taking a very different technological course. The fact of the matter is one of the reasons why we're in the mess that we're in, not just one of many of the reasons, uh, is that uh, We've hit scarcities of conventional oil. We need alternative energy sources. That's a good signal uh, to do something 
very, very different. Uh, the food crisis that also impacted this year is a climate change crisis to some extent at least, not only, but to some extent. We've had lots of signals why it's important actually to change direction profoundly. And I think it will help if we move away from mechanisms for part of this discussion and talk about what really can be done and why it's not going to break economies. Here's what it really means, not the tricks of how to do it, by what, who trades what with whom, but actually what it's going to mean for men and women in their jobs, uh, the kind of electricity we're going to get when we switch on the switch and the kind of cars that we're going to drive in the future. Those are the main drivers of what we're talking about. And we should talk about those things. Our elected representatives will understand that a lot better and the public will as well. And then finally at the end, we can explain that if you're going to shift to this other kind of power plant, when the regulators look at the conventional power plant and this new kind of power plant, they're going to ask what's the lower cost? And if indeed there's a carbon price weighing on the scale in that calculation, they'll see that the lower cost is the low emission power plant. But if there's no carbon price weighing on the scales, then they're going to go with the conventional plant as they have to under the law. Whether that's through a permit or a tax is about the tenth order of importance in this. I believe all of those smart financial engineers, I think you'll be great physical engineers too. Uh, and that's where we're going to really need the mileage to get this thing done. Okay, thank you very much. And final word, Evo. <laughs> I doubt I'll ever get the final word. Uh, but um, on, the, on the gender question, I mean, I, I talked at the beginning or a while ago about if, if you don't respect the small, you're not worth the big. I, th I think that we need to adjust, address the gender issue in every situation that we can. I mean, I think the reality is, and we're seeing it, that, that financial institutions, financial mechanisms, uh, energy organizations are, are gender skewed. And there, there are things that we can actually do about that. So while waiting for the perfect world, we are actually working together in the Climate Change Secretariat with I IUCN to build on work we've already done on gender and climate, to, to do today what we can do today while working on uh, tomorrow. I think that my closing remark would be that I've always been a great fan of backcasting. I've always been a great fan of defining the perfect future and then checking every step you take in terms of whether it brings you closer to that future or further away from it. But I think on climate change, in spite of my love for backcasting, we will, for the next couple of years, still be in an incremental mode. We are still learning. We're moving forward carefully. Uh, we're trying to help each other along a road to what is feasible. So for the time being, even though it may be imperfect, for the next couple of years, I think we still need to be, unsatisfying though it may be, in a process of moving forward, building confidence, growing the crowd, and not yet in a position to, to, to be able to identify a common, shared, clear vision of the perfect future. Well, thank you very much. I would like to, uh, first of all, thank all the people who had provided questions <clears throat> online. I was unable to cover them all. There were some uh, excellent questions there, and certainly it's clear that beyond this room, there's a lively debate and discussion going on around these issues. Uh, and I would like to thank very much for the people behind the scenes who helped organize this. This was done in an incredibly short period of time. So uh, Jennifer and Jeff, your people, uh, Rick, uh, Kerry, and all the other people uh, who helped to organize this, uh, thank you very much and a warm hand of applause for your efforts. And then finally, of course, the speakers. And thank you again for taking the time and looking forward to continuing discussions on this. Thank you. Bye-bye.